Amen. Amen. You excited to be here today? That was not good enough. But we'll hopefully that'll change over the next few moments. Amen? Amen. If you've got your Bible, you can take your Bible out and you can open to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And as you're heading there, just one more time, if you came in a little bit later, just want to welcome all of you to our church. I want to welcome anyone who's here for the very first time. We're excited that you're here with us today. Hope that if you're new to our church today, over the last few weeks, you'll join us as soon as this service is over for our welcome party in our cafe. Looking forward to meeting you. I um, want to make sure I invite all of you, if you're not already planning to, to be back here next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to have a special guest speaker with us. His name is Pastor Brian Campbell, and he is one of the leaders of the Fire Bible Movement. And uh, we've heard about that over the years. I'm going to let him explain more of that. But it's a powerful evangelistic movement that's happening around the world to provide the Word of God where it has never been before. And so he's going to be sharing a lot about the uh, testimonies and stories, and it's going to be a powerful, powerful morning. And although I don't believe she's in here, she's probably back with our children, um, I did ask her for permission on this because she made it Facebook public. But if you see our children's pastor, Melina, Melina Corella and her husband, James, they just announced this past week that they are expecting their very first child. James is here. I see James. He's here. So we're excited for them. And uh, we encourage, find them after service, celebrate with them, and keep them in, their, in your prayers in this new season. Um, we're excited for what God is doing in their lives and in the lives of our church. Amen? Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. Jesus, would you unite your church this morning? Not just us, but right now, hundreds of thousands of churches are gathering to worship you. And um, Lord, the church is very divided right now. We're sending a very poor message to the world of who our God is. But I believe that one Sunday morning can unite the church like never before. Let it happen among us, and let it spill into our communities. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can take your seat. Be sure to grab your neighbor. Tell him you love him this morning. Amen. Amen. So I'm not going to lie. Uh, about two months ago, right? Well, I guess a little bit longer than that. Towards the end of the summer, Pastor Kurt, he uh, sat me down, and we kind of went through the next six months or so of preaching, who's going to be on what weeks and everything. And he said, hey, I'm going to be out of town on November the 3rd, so that'll be your week. And at first I'm like, yeah, that's great. I can't wait. And then I looked at the calendar. I'm like, oh, so I get to preach the Sunday before the election. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> had to be that way. I was like, that's not really what I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, honestly, though, as I prayed, as I thought about it, I said, we're not going to talk about an election. I'm ready for it to be over. I can't wait for Wednesday, one way or another, I can't wait. But I said, we're not going to talk about an election. At this point, we've said everything that there is to be said. You know, Pastor Kurt um, explained just about a month ago, really where we should be standing, that we should make our votes based on biblical principles, that we should vote for policies over people, and that we should not allow anything political to divide us and to rip us apart, and we should not allow, and we should pray over these things, and we should trust everything else to the Lord. Like, there's only so much that we can say. There's only so much that needs to be said. And listen, I'm just like anybody else. I'm going to go Tuesday, and I'm going to vote. All right? I believe we all should vote. I'm a big proponent. Hundreds of thousands of men and women have given their lives so that we would have the opportunity to vote in this country. And um, the vast majority of the world would give everything for the chance to vote. I think it's very selfish when we don't. It's very, we should be part of that. And uh, last year, and I don't say this to endorse anybody, this is just a fact. Last year, four million Christians were not part of our voting process. Four million people of God did not make their voice known. We should get out and we should vote. But in the end of the day, and I'm just like anyone else, I'm going to vote. I have 
my personal convictions about what I feel is best for our nation, but in the end, I'm going to go to sleep Tuesday night okay because I know that my God is in control. I know that whatever happens on Tuesday has no bearing on my eternal destination. I know that what happens on Tuesday, maybe it impacts the way I live my day-to-day -day life. Maybe it impacts certain things about how this country operates, but it has no impact on who I will stand with for all of eternity. That was taken care of 2,000 years ago at the cross. So I'm good. And I know, as the, as the older song says, I know that my Redeemer lives and I will stand with Him in the end. That's what I believe. All right. So that's all I'm going to say. But, here, but here's what I will say. I think this is important. And this was a thought that was deep on my heart really the last two elections. And that's this, that on Tuesday night, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. Very, very straightforward. There's going to be a winning candidate and a losing candidate. There's going to be a winning party and a losing party. And there are going to be winning voters and there are going to be losing voters. That's just the way this goes. But if the church becomes, remains, or is divided, everybody loses. You know, we all think that because we have a tendency to think that the church is just supposed to sit in our corner and we're just not supposed to be seen by the world. I believe the scriptures bear out that we are supposed to occupy the space that we are in. I believe that we are not just supposed to sit back and let the world crumble. We are supposed to occupy the schools. We're supposed to occupy the local governments. We're supposed to occupy the space that we're in. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He says, you are the ones that have been entrusted with this good news, this gospel message, and we should go forward and preach that gospel and be a light wherever we go. The church was meant to be a beacon of hope, a beacon of righteousness in a dark and crumbling environment. And if the church is divided one way or another. There's a million reasons why churches divide, but especially in this hour, if the church divides, everybody loses. Because all of a sudden, the one thing that God has put in place that can hold things together, that can preach the good news, if that can't be on the same page, nothing will be on the same page. And on Tuesday, well, Wednesday, more so Wednesday morning, half of this country is going to be disillusioned. And they're going to be asking themselves, what's the future hold for me and my family? They're going to be wondering, is this the end of our nation? They're going to be wondering how they are supposed to move forward. And what I pray and what I hope is that when they are looking for something to trust in, they can look at the church and find stability, they can find unity, and they can say, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going to put, that's not where I'm going to put my hope, but that's where I'm going to go to find my hope. That's what I want people to experience. That's what I want people to find. And even if People are on the winning side. We know exactly, I mean, listen, I hate to say it, and at the end of this service, we're going to pray against it, but we know that no matter what happens on Tuesday, there's going to be division in our culture. That's just going to happen. All right, we don't want it to happen, but there will be protests. There will be hatred. All right, I despise my social media right now because of how disgusting it currently is. It's just nothing but hatred. Nothing but violence. And we just know what's coming. And what I hope people see from the church is a group of men and women who have not been rocked by a simple vote. If our faith is so weak that it can be rocked by a political candidate, we do not know our God. And we do not know what he can do. And so the world should not look at us and see people that have been rocked, but rather see people that have been unified. Because we were called to be that beacon of light and truth and hope in the world. Jesus was the one that said in John 13, he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, and you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus was the one that said, you want to know how the world is going to know who you serve? Your love for each other. He doesn't say your love for everyone else, although we are called to love everyone else. Do not take me wrong. But he says, the love that you are to have within the body of Christ, that is the sign. That is what will treat, because you can't find that kind of love anywhere else. I was at the dog park yesterday, taking my dog for a walk. It was a nice day. And for some reason, the park was packed yesterday. I've never seen it this packed before. And you know what? I was at the dog park, the happiest place on earth. And all I heard was hatred the whole time. 
All right, I just put my hood on and my earphones in and just tried to avoid it. But all I heard was hatred from both sides. It was just, I'm like, we're at the dog park. It's like our, our, our dogs are just hanging around playing and you have to talk about, pol- like, it was just, it was so discouraging. But I'm like, that, but that reminded me, there is a love, there is a unity, there is a peace that only can happen in the church. It can't happen in the world. It can only happen as men and women have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, as they've been empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit of God that redeems us, that sanctifies us, that transforms us. That's where that love begins. That's where that peace is experienced. And that's where unity is made possible. And that's what I want people to see, regardless of what happens. I hope that all of us go to bed Tuesday night peacefully. We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And we'll be okay. God will be with us because he's promised. And he's the one that, pro- that said this um, right after the verse we just read. He says, in this life, you will experience many trials and tribulations, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. My faith is not in a political candidate. My, pa- my faith is not in policy. My faith is in Jesus. And I'm trusting him. And I want the world to see that kind of unity. So today, what we're going to do is rather than focusing on all of the possible things that will end up dividing us, we're going to focus on the one. Everyone say one. One. We're going to focus on the one thing that was meant to unite us. Now, forever, and for all of eternity. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, I thought about it all week. I was preparing my notes and... I was like, when should I give like the the point of the message? Should I save it to the end? And I'm like, no, I'm going to say it right from the beginning. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that unites us. It is the cross of Jesus Christ that is the reason we're here. It's the reason we gather. And we're going to talk about this later in the message, but we have a tendency to make our faith about a lot of different things. But in the end of the day, the reason we are here, the only thing that matters is the cross of Jesus Christ, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's what was meant to unite us. We were never meant to be united about all of these earthly things. We were never meant to be united in that we see life the exact same way. We are united through the blood, the shed blood, the perfect shed blood of our Savior. And as we make our way to communion this morning, that's what I want us to focus our attention on, is the blood of Jesus. And see, division is not a new thing within the church. All right, division has been happening ever since the church began. And that's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter one. Paul is addressing the church at Corinth and he had gotten word from different people within the church that division was starting to rise up. And the word division that he actually uses there, it means to tear apart. The Greek word means literally, Paul was saying, you are tearing one another apart. You are tearing apart the body of Christ. And so he says, I'm writing you because I'm trying to get out ahead of this. I'm trying to remind you that the church is not meant to be divided. The church is meant to be a beacon of hope and unity in a lost and dying world. And he goes forward and he says, he says um, let there be no divisions among you. Now that word really convicted me, that word no. Because I think about it. How many things have a tendency to divide us in a church? How much gossip is in the church? How much back-talking about each other is taking place? He says, let no divisions. So the moment I see a division, I am against God in that moment. He says, let there be no divisions among you, but be of the same mind, be of the same judgment. Does that mean we're all gonna see things exactly the same? Of course not. But there is a great difference between disagreement and division. We are able to disagree. We see that in the life of Paul. We see that in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament, that sometimes there's going to be moments of disagreement, and that's okay. Division is something entirely different. Division rips apart the very message of the gospel. And what, what we're going to see here is that our division can actually lessen the power of the message of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to be guilty of that. I want the message of Jesus to go forward in power and transform lives. Amen? And so in this particular, um, in this particular uh, moment, he addresses the type of division that this church was experiencing. And so in the very next verse, in verse 11, it says, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And what I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, 
or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except for Crispus and Gatius, so that none of you would be able to say that you were baptized in my name. So in this particular church, the division that they were experiencing was a division over personalities. Each of the people in Corinth, they had come to Jesus under the teaching, under the leadership of someone different. Some, they came under, to Jesus under Paul. Some came to Jesus under Peter. Some came Apollos. And some were being super spiritual and say, well, I came just because of Jesus. I don't need anybody else. And they were being the super religious people. But ultimately, what it was doing is it was ripping everyone apart because they were elevating people over the message. They were elevating personalities over Christ. And it was causing division. And the people that came under, under Paul, they were off in their corner saying, we're better than you because we knew Paul. And then the ones that came under Peter were like, well, Peter knew Jesus before Paul ever did, so we know better. And then some were like, well, we came under Apollos, and they're all dividing over one another. And what Paul is going to reveal throughout the rest of what we're going to read is that it's not about people. It's about Jesus. What he's going to reveal is it's not about our differences, it's about the gospel. And whenever we start to elevate people, whenever we start to elevate different thoughts and values over Jesus, that's when division creeps in. That division in every single circumstance happens when we start to put more value on people and things and they become more important than Christ. Whenever the gospel, whenever the cross is not our focus, division is shortly coming. And that's always the way it goes, whether it's gossip, whether it's lying, whether it's talking about leaders, whether it's talking about other people in our church, whether it's those, and this happens so much more than I wish it did, when it's people clawing for leadership positions, when they want the church to be a place where they can build their own platform and where they can be seen and where they can be noticed, it's because the gospel is not our priority. It's because we've made ourself, our egos, our pride, our selfishness, our name, whatever it is, our rights, we've made that more important than Jesus. We've made it more important than the cross. And we've stood on the very blood Jesus shed to promote our own agenda. And that's how division creeps in. And that's what was happening here. And so that's why Paul, right out the gate, after he talks about the division, what does he say? He says, is Christ divided? Of course not. The very unity that we're supposed to have as a church is to be a reflection of the unity that Jesus has with God the Father. The unity that we see within the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he reminds them, no, Christ is not divided. So if there's division among you, what message does that send to the world about the God we serve? If the world sees us divided, why would they want anything to do with the God that we say we serve? They won't want any. We wonder why no one takes the church seriously. We wonder why no one wants anything to do with our faith. Maybe it's because they don't see anyone of faith. Maybe it's because they think, listen, look at you guys. You come every Sunday, you lift your hands and worship, and you hate just as much as anyone else. You're divided just as much as anybody else. You preach a message of love, and you have no love. You preach a message of grace, and you've never experienced grace. You preach a message of caring for one another and, and strengthening each other, and all you are is at odds with one another. Why would anyone care anything about the God we serve? We need to be a reflection of, of the unity that he has. But then he goes forward and he says, was Paul crucified for you? This is where Paul, I love it. He starts to change everything now. He's addressed, he's addressed the division. Now he's going to start talking about what unites us. He says, is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. He's like, you guys are all following these different people. None of them have ever done anything for you. They might have preached the gospel for you. They might have introduced you to Jesus, but you would have nothing if it wasn't for him. You would have nothing if it wasn't for the cross. Paul's words would be empty if it wasn't for the cross of Jesus Christ. He is reminding the people that it isn't about the person that you came to know Jesus from. It is about Jesus himself. It is about him alone. Only he died for you. Only he surrendered everything for you. He's like, did, did Jesus die for you? No. He's like, were you baptized in the name of Paul? And just to be a little bit on the nose, insert name of political candidate here. Did that person die for you? No. 
Were you baptized in their name? No. Can that person do anything really for your soul? No. He's like, this is all about Jesus. Everything is about Christ. And it's foolish and dangerous to focus on anything or anyone but Christ. He needs to be the sole focus of the church. He needs to be the focus of our lives and everything that we do. And he continues in verse 17, and he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. And again, Paul now, he's beginning to pivot. He's focused on the division. Now he's ready to focus on what unites us, to reminding us what this is all about. And he brings everything to the gospel. And even in some ways, he's like, God did not call me here just to baptize you. He didn't call me here to build up my name. He didn't call me here to gain a following. He called me to do what? Preach the gospel. That's it. He's like, that's what I was called to do. And if we can fast forward to our day, that's what we're called to do. We aren't called to build our own names. We aren't called to build our own reputations. We are called to preach the good news of Jesus. That word gospel, if you're new to our church, if you're new to Christianity, that's what that means. It means good news. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, the life, death, and resurrection. It is the message that I was once lost, and now I'm found, not by anything that I could do, but through the life of Jesus Christ. It is a message that I, on my own, am a sinner, heading towards an eternity separated from God, but it is through Christ that I have been reconciled to the Father. Ephesians chapter 2 says that you who were once far off from God have now been brought in by the blood of Jesus. This is the gospel. It's the message that Jesus came to love one of us. But what's powerful here and what's terrifying really is that Paul is saying that this gospel with all of its power, with all of its effectiveness can be made powerless by pride and selfishness and arrogance, and division. Listen, I believe that the gospel message does not require anything from me. The gospel is enough on its own. Jesus didn't need me to save the world. He doesn't need us to save the world. Jesus did that on the cross by himself alone. Jesus is the, is the answer. But Jesus allows us to partner with him, to preach the good news, to take it where it's never gone before. And what Paul is saying is that when we bring the gospel with all of our arrogance and we try to, to spice it up, if I could say it that way, when we bring it with all that and all this division and things of that, it can actually empty the gospel of its power. It can empty it of its power to rescue and save and transform. And he says that the word of the cross, this gospel message, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. And you may wonder, what does he mean by foolishness? Well, you gotta take it back to the context that it was in. In the days of Paul, in the days of Jesus, the cross was not some kind of dignified way of death. It was a, res a death reserved for the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, for the worst criminals possible. And so the very idea to the world that somehow we would be rescued and saved through the cross, they would think that that's foolishness. And what Paul's going to explain here in just a minute is that God has always had a way of taking the foolish things of this world to put to bed the wisdom of this world. He has taken the foolish things that the world sees and he has used them to bring about the greatest miracle. But it hit me this week. It talks about how it's foolishness to those who are perishing. And I just had this thought that a divided church cannot help those who are perishing. I know that might not seem like this big epiphany, but I just thought of that this week. I'm like, there is a world that is perishing. And we don't, like Pastor Kurt, he really laid this out well for us last week. We don't talk enough about hell. We're afraid to talk about it. We're afraid of offending people. But we don't talk about it enough that there is, that the majority, people, or Jesus was the one that said, narrow is the gate that leads to eternity, and few will find it. The majority of people in this world are heading towards an eternity separated from God. We don't talk about it often, 
But there is a world that is perishing right now. And a divided church has no power to rescue. A divided church has no, I don't even know if we have authority to stand on to try to speak because many of us might be perishing right along with them. Because if we are the ones bringing in division into the church, how can we ever say that we're walking with Christ? A divided church cannot help them, but the gospel can. And a united church can bring the gospel to a world that is perishing like nothing else can. And Paul goes on in verse 19. And again, I would encourage you, I should have said this in the beginning, but this is a very dense chapter. There's a lot here, a lot of context, certainly more than we can tackle in our time together. So I would encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. But we're going to just try to focus it in here on the unity uh, side of this, but there's so much more here. But in verse 19, he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, uh, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And there's a lot there. In fact, I read that this week and I was like, wow, there's, there's a lot of things to unpackage. I think in the commentaries I was looking up, that was like the biggest section. It was huge. But I think the the main thing that I'll just pull from here is this. Whenever human wisdom is elevated above the gospel, division will begin to creep in. Whenever we start looking to the wisdom of people, whenever we start looking to the wisdom of the world, that's when division begins to creep in. You know, listen, I'm in this, uh, Paul's addressing, I think, both the church and the unbelieving world. For our sake today, I just want to focus on us as believers There is a tendency for us to follow human wisdom and human concepts and human ideas. And the moment that we prioritize that over the gospel, that's when division starts to come in. That's when we start to follow people rather than Jesus. That's when we make the church more about what we can receive rather than our service before the king. Rather than, as Paul would say, living our lives and giving them as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Human wisdom often leads to division, but the wisdom of the Lord, that is what leads to unity. That's what transforms a culture. And he goes forward in verse 22, and he says, for the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. I love this. It's been one of my favorite verses since I was a child when he says, but we preach Christ crucified. He's like, listen, the Jews, and if you read your gospel, you'll see this all the time. He's like, they just want constant signs. They're always looking for the big miracle, something to prove. The Greeks, they're focused on all the wisdom. They just want to intellectually get to God. But we preach Christ crucified crucified, which is Paul's way of saying, we're not trying to make the story sound better than it is. We're not trying to make it all eloquent. We're not trying to sanitize it. We preach the raw truth of the gospel, and that is that Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, was nailed to a cross. His body was ripped to shreds. His blood poured out for the sins of mankind. And it is that message that saves. It is that message that heals. And it is that message that we preach. The gospel, very rarely, I could almost say never, is never what people want to hear. But it is what people need to hear. No one wants to hear the message of the gospel. Because the message of the cross forces us to ask a really important question. Why is a savior on the cross? And the answer to that question is because of me. It's my sin. The cross forces me to realize my sinfulness. The cross forces me to realize that I, on my own, am not enough. The force makes me realize that I am the reason for this suffering. I am the reason for this bloodshed. And maybe even more than that, it makes me realize that I truly am indebted to this man who gave everything for me. 
and anything short of laying down my life is not enough. The cross forces me to look internally. The world doesn't want to hear that message. The world wants nothing to do with it, but it is the message that transforms. There's this old story, metaphor, of this church, older church, and on the gateway to the church, as people were entering into the building, there were the words written, we preach Christ crucified. And it was an effective church, a powerful church that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. But over time, moss began to grow along the church. And eventually, the word crucified was covered. And all it read was, we preach Christ. That sounds good, I preach Christ. But the problem is, it takes away the important part of Christ. They began to preach Christ as they saw him. They, saw, they began to say, you know what, I'm going to focus on the pieces of Jesus that I love the most. I love that Jesus loves me. I love that Jesus wants me to be charitable. I love that Jesus wants us to love one another, and that's good. That's a good thing. Jesus said all of those things, but they forgot the very words of Jesus who said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for a ransom for many. May it be said here, I know that it's been said before, you never have to worry about that in this church. The reason Jesus came to this earth is to die for it. That was his mission. His mission was not social justice. The message of Jesus was not just so that we would love one another more. Those are outgrowths of the gospel. Jesus came to die upon a cross and rise from the dead to secure our salvation. That is why Jesus came. And so if you preach Christ but not crucified, then you've missed who Jesus is. And you've recreated Jesus in your image, not in the image that he came as. But that story continues because eventually it became that the moss grew over the word Christ. And so now it just said, we preach. You preach what? What do you preach if you're not preaching Jesus? And all of a sudden their messages became inspirational speeches. They became about motivation. They became about living your best life now. Some of you read that book. It became about how can I grow my finances? The message became how can I, can I, how can I be better in my workplace? How can I be better in this? And it became motivational speeches where the gospel, maybe with the Bible, was referenced, but it wasn't preached. I'll be honest with you. If somehow, some way, you can stomach preachers that reference the Bible but don't preach it, I don't know what to tell you. And I don't say this because I, I try to say this as humbly as I can. But more often than not, preaching the gospel is becoming very, very few and far between. Churches are becoming more about inspirational speeches where we read a little verse in the very beginning to get us started and then we just give our own thoughts and our own ideas. And we try to tell people how about living the greatest life that they can and following Jesus will make everything better. Tell that to all the apostles who died for Christ. Following Jesus is not about my comfort. Following Jesus is not about my success. Following Jesus is about Jesus, wherever he takes me. But eventually the moss grew and it only said, we. And all of a sudden that church ceased to be a church. And it became a social community where they gathered. Sure, they loved each other, but the message of the gospel was gone completely. Every generation of Christians has been tempted at some point or another to sanitize the message of the cross, to make it more appealing to people, to make it fit better into our cultural moment. The gospel doesn't need us to do anything with it. The gospel is enough on its own. And the moment that we begin to take, if I can put it this way, when we strip away the teeth of the gospel, when we strip away the hard edges of the gospel, it loses its power to transform people. There's no transformation in just thinking that Jesus was some good moral teacher. There's a million of them that none of us care about. You know, a lot of Christians, they, they put Jesus on the same pedestal that they put Gandhi on, and that's nothing against Gandhi. But I don't follow Gandhi. So if I don't follow him, why would I follow Jesus? There comes a point where Jesus has to be different, where Jesus has to be separate. And the reason he is is because he gave his life. 
The reason Jesus is different is because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. That's why he's different. That's why he alone can transform. Jesus isn't one of many ways to God. He is the way to God. The only one. And that's not popular. And people don't like that because they're like, well, you're just discounting all of these people. No, it is a mandate to the church to get undivided and go reach people with the message of Jesus and take it where it's never gone before. And Paul went forward in verse 26, and he said, So consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human might be able to boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so Paul, there's a lot again that we could say here, and there's a lot of context here, and a lot more that we could say, but essentially what Paul is getting at here as he's like, guys, listen, I see the division in the church and all of the division can be rooted back to pride and to selfishness and to arrogance and to elevating people and parties and politics all above the gospel of Jesus. And he says, so I want you, and he, it was a, maybe a slight insult. He's like, so I want you to remember who you are. You're nothing. You see, I mean, that's, this is where the gospel hurts because all of us deep down want to believe we're something. But what Paul is trying to tell the, the Corinthian church and what I think he is saying is we are nothing. That we are sinful people. We are broken people. And as part from God, there is nothing good or redeeming of us. You know, I, I, it's, not, it's not on the slides or anything, but all of us, most of us know John 3.16. Or I'm sorry, not John 3.16, right before John 3.16 where Jesus says, if anyone would enter my kingdom, they must first be born again. And we love that verse. It's a romantic verse, and we love it. And, and for us, we put it on t-shirts, and we put it on bookmarkers and all these things. But if you really think about it, that is the single most offensive verse in the entire Bible. Because what Jesus was essentially saying is, the person that you are is not right. If I need to be born again, it's because who I am is not how I'm supposed to be. And there's nothing in me that's about saving what I have. It's not about, hey, I just need a little bit more Jesus, a little bit more spirituality. No, Jesus says, you need a start over. Who you are is sinful, broken. There is nothing in you that is good and holy and righteous. Your only hope is Jesus. Your only hope is this message of the gospel. Division happens when we think we're more than we are. Division happens when we think, yeah, I came to Jesus because I needed a little bit more spirituality in my life, but I didn't come to Jesus because I needed him to transform who I was. And that's what I need. I don't need Jesus to teach me how to be more moral. I need Jesus to transform my very soul. I need Jesus to transform my very heart. And anything that I have, anything that I'll ever be, is solely because of Jesus and that's why he says, if you're going to boast, you boast in one person. It's Jesus Christ. He's who I was rescued by. He's the one. That's why he started this whole thing by saying, was Paul crucified for you? No. Only Jesus can set you free. Only Jesus is enough. But then he finishes this section. And worship team, you guys can begin to make your way. In the very next chapter, he continues this thought. In 1 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 1, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you 
except Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I love this. And there's a little context here. If you go back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 and 18, it's in, it's in chapter 18 that Paul, for the very first time, makes his way to the city of Corinth, which is what he's referring to when I first came to you. Chapter 18. That's when he first arrived at Corinth. That's when he preached to them Christ crucified. But if you go to chapter 17, right before he goes to Corinth, Paul is in the city of Athens. And Athens, Greece at that time was the center of basically all human wisdom and thought and philosophy. It's where everyone came to give their new ideas about math and about the world and about the meaning of life and all of those things. And I'll preface this by saying biblical scholars disagree with this on some way. So I'm going to go with the people that see it one way because I think that this is evident here. When Paul arrived in Athens, Paul preaches at a place called the Areopagus. And all of these philosophers and leaders, they had all gathered to hear him. And if you compare Paul's message that he preached to them with the message that he preached is everywhere else, it's very different. It's very intellectual. It's as if Paul, to some degree, was trying to meet them on their terms and philosophize. There's nothing wrong with what he said. Everything he said is of the Lord, but you can tell he brought a little bit more eloquent speech to it. And what it says at the end of chapter 17 is that some listened to him. Some believed him. Others said, eh, we'll hear it again. Maybe there's something to it. And then others said, who is this person talking about a cross? And it seems, in comparison to other times that Paul proclaimed the gospel, that this wasn't the most effective moment of his ministry. And so it makes sense that when he arrived in Corinth, he says, I was there in weakness. I was there in trembling. Because maybe Paul was starting to realize something, and that's why he said, so when I came to you in Corinth, I decided that I was going to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because I realized it isn't human wisdom that matters. It isn't my eloquent speech that matters. What matters is the gospel of Jesus. And I don't care if people don't want to hear it. I don't care if people are offended by it. And I don't care what it costs me. There is nothing in this world more important than the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's everything. Paul realized that the cross was everything. That everything centered around it. That the cross is the central moment of all history. That the cross is not just an event of the Bible. It is the event of the Bible. That all of the Old Testament is leading us to the cross. And Jesus dies and he rises from the dead. And when it's over, the rest of the New Testament looks back on the cross. It is the cross of Christ that split history in half. The cross is the central moment of history. It is the sole focus of the gospel. And unfortunately, we have this dangerous tendency, and a lot of us have done it. We have made our faith about other things. We've made our faith about other peripheral things. And I'm not even saying that all of the things that we focus on are terrible, but they're not the gospel. And I don't want to make any enemies today, but I need you to know, the gospel message is not about your marriage, and it isn't about saving it. The gospel message is not about your finances. The gospel message is not about getting healed. The gospel message is not about understanding about the end times. The gospel message is about the blood and the resurrection of Jesus, period. That's what it's about. That doesn't mean that those other things aren't important. But those things are outgrowths 
of the gospel, of the message of Jesus. And I'll just use marriage as the example. What did Paul say about marriage? He said, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So when Paul says you need to understand marriage, he says, go back to the cross. Because everything starts there. It's always been about Jesus. It's about the, the death of the perfect Son of God who bore the wrath of God for our sins because we were separated from Him. And He died and gave His life as the atonement for our sin. And He rose again to grant us eternal life. This is what the gospel is about. And this is what unites us. This is what unites us. The blood, the shed blood of Jesus. I don't mean this to, again, hurt anyone's feelings. But every year we get dozens and dozens and dozens of baptism testimonies. People that want to be baptized. We're excited. We had such a powerful Sunday last week. But more often than not, the testimonies come in like this. You know, I was in a really low place in my life. And I prayed to God and I started coming to church and now I feel better. That's not the gospel. So people will say, you know, I was in a really low place in my life and I said, Lord, if you'll just give me this, then I'll follow you. The Lord needs nothing of you. You have nothing to bargain with. He already did everything. That's not the gospel. And people will say, you know, I came to Jesus for this reason and this reason and, 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 and I, I needed him to help me in my marriage and I needed him to help me in my finances and I needed to help me in all of these different things. And it's just like, listen, I love you enough to say, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the message of the cross that challenges us and that changes us and it transforms us. That's what the message of Jesus is. This Christian faith is not be about becoming more spiritual. It's not just about believing in God or being a better person. It is about the shed blood of Jesus that alone has the power to save. The Bible says the demons believe in God. It needs to be about more than that. It's about Jesus. And when the cross isn't the central focus, that's when our worship becomes about us. That's when our songs become about worshiping ourselves and not about bringing praise to God. It's when our preaching becomes more about motivation than transformation. When the cross isn't the center, the church will become divided and maybe even worse, powerless. I won't go too far into this, but you hear about it all the time. Liberal Christianity, progressive Christianity, and it sounds cool and trendy because they say how much they love and they've discovered the real thing. But the problem is they've done exactly what we've talked about. They've stripped away the gospel from the Bible. And they've turned Jesus into an image of themselves. And they've lost all the power that comes from the gospel. The power of the gospel is not in that just Jesus was a real person. The power is that Jesus gave his life. And he rose from the dead. And he offers eternity in his hands for anyone who would believe. And the cross, in all of its scandal, in all of the horror, in all of its bloody history, it's what unites us. Because it takes the attention off of us. Think about this. The reason that there's division in the church is because all the attention is on us in what we want. The cross forces us to do the exact opposite. The cross makes me look at an innocent lamb of God and say it's all about him and what he did. It exposes our sin, it reveals our imperfections, and it points to the only person that can save us, Jesus. There's no room for division when our eyes are set on Jesus. This is why, as we make our way to communion, this is why communion was always the center of the early church gatherings. For the first 1,500 years of church history, when they gathered together, there was no platform. And I say that very humbly because I know I'm on it right now. And maybe we'll figure out a better way to do it one day. But for the first 1,500 years, when you gathered as a church, you want to know what the center of that room was? Communion. 
It was the body and blood of Jesus because it sent a message to the believers that this is why we're here. This is why we celebrate. This is why we pray. This is why we gather. That no matter what you felt or what you were experiencing, what mattered most was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Can he heal your body? Yes. Can he heal your mind? Yes. Can he restore your family? 100%. Can he do all those things? Yes. But what he wants more than anything is for us to focus on the gospel of Jesus. Because one day, no matter what, our bodies are going to give out. One day life is going to be over. And the only thing that matters is the gospel of Jesus. And as time has gone on, culture has made its way into our teachings. And the cross tends to get pushed out. Because it's far more enjoyable to come to church and talk about our problems. Than to spend time with our friends and sing songs that inspire us. But from the beginning, it was always about Jesus, the cross that saves, the blood of Jesus that unites us. The reason there's so much division in the church is because our eyes have shifted off of the sufferings of Christ. But when Jesus and his death and his resurrection are at the center of our life and worship, there's no room for division. There's no room for hatred and strife and fighting. Christianity is not about getting what I want. It's not about my name. It's not about life being perfect. It's about Jesus, period. And Revelation says this. Parents, I need you to come help me right here. Revelation 5 says this. This is an image of a day to come for all of us. In Revelation 5, it says, this is John speaking. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. There is a day coming when all the kingdoms of this world will be over and they'll be the kingdoms of our God and what we will celebrate together is not our politics. It is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus will outweigh everything else. When we stand around his throne, we're not going to be celebrating that everything worked out in our lives. We're not going to be celebrating that our side won elections. We're going to be celebrating the blood of Jesus that has saved us, that has healed us, and that has redeemed us. Amen? If you believe that, can you stand with me this morning? And would you lift your hands as we sing this song just for a moment? Amen. Jesus, we worship you. We're going to be part of that day. Come on, let's worship him now.
we're going to be part of that day when we stand around his throne, there's nothing that says that we can't begin to celebrate the lamb who was slain today. And that's what we're going to do as we take communion. I promise we're going to honor your time. I know it's getting a little bit late and we're going to end this time. We're going to pray for unity as a church. We're going to pray over our nation. I feel like it'd be wrong for us not to. We're going to pray for healing across this land. But it's in this mode that we're going to receive communion together. And um, we believe in an open communion. If you're new to our church, we believe that anyone can receive communion. The only thing that we ask is that you have made Jesus the Lord of your life. If you have uh, received Christ as your Savior, you are part of the church of Jesus Christ. And we encourage you to celebrate with us. But we do always want to ask, and the the team, they're going to lead us in a short chorus as the elements are being distributed. We're just going to ask that you do what the Bible says and examine your heart and ask the Lord if there is any unrepented sin in your life. And if there is, this is the moment to deal with it. Not the moment to run from it. This is the moment to deal with it and to walk before Him. And so, Jesus, would you guide us over these next few moments? Search us, O Lord. And may we honor the sacrifice that you made together. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take a moment as this song is sung, examine your hearts, and right now the elements are going to be distributed. Thank him for his blood. Amen. Paul says, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for your blood the bread of, for your body, the bread of life that was bruised 
that was broken for us. Jesus, we are so unworthy of your sacrifice. The cross stands as the ultimate symbol of love and mercy that we've ever seen. Jesus, will we never count it as something common? Would we never take moments like this for granted? But may we live in light of your sacrifice each day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's take together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this bread, or eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus, that's what we do today. We have proclaimed the death and resurrection of our Savior that still stands as the only hope for mankind. And we thank you that there's still power in the blood of Christ. It has the power to save and it has the power to heal, but it has the power to unite us. Lord, forgive us for ever making this faith church or our lives about us. And I pray that today would be a moment that as a community we center ourselves and remind us that it is always only about Jesus. And we thank you for it in your name. Amen. Let's take together. I'm going to ask that you just hold on to those elements just for a minute. We're going to pray and then we're going to dismiss. But I'm going to invite one of our elders, Brother Mel Allshafer. He's going to come this morning and he's going to pray. He's going to lead us in prayer. But in a spirit of unity and on behalf of our nation. Dana, could you just get me the microphone that's right there? In the spirit of unity and in the spirit of prayer, I'm going to ask you, cross the aisles, and I'm not even going to ask today if you're comfortable. I'm just going to ask you to take the hand of the person next to you. We are the family of Jesus. And I'm just going to ask you, Brother Mel, he's going to lead us in prayer, but you cry out for this church, you cry out for this nation. We're not praying for a particular result. We're praying that the kingdom of God would come in our nation. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, there's no other words to say that we were recreated, all of us, we were created to worship you. It was good. It has never changed. It will never change. Our purpose here is to worship you, a most holy and righteous God. And Father, in this room and in churches throughout this country, there is a standard that has been set from day one that has always held true, and that is simply this. As your children, we have the power to change nations, Amen. to change the world, but that power is in the name of Jesus Christ Amen. and the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that raised Christ, I'm told, is in us. And I'm told that Christ has made his home in us. So that means, Father, that the words that we say, the prayers that we offer for our families, our church, our friends, our nation and the world are the only prayers you hear. You hear the prayers of the righteous. You hear the prayers of those that stand in right standing with you. And Lord, I pray that today, that knowing full well there are only two positions, either we are holy or we're not. And I ask now, having had communion, that each one of us, having searched our hearts, can truly lift her hands and their spirits and say, I am, in fact, in a holy position before the Lord through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, I know full well that you are an honorable God. You are a God that is more than able to meet all our needs, whether it be personal, whether it be physical, whether it be spiritual, whether it be national, whether it be international. This is the world you created. We are the children 
that you've created. We are the people that you will hear from. Amen. And it is the prayer of the righteous, Father, of a repentant nation, of a repentant group of people that will, in fact, see your will be done down here as it is in heaven. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. 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 Can you give God praise this morning? Amen.